Good morning. Uh, we start this morning with general questions and with question number one, John Mason. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Glasgow City Council, Police Scotland and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde regarding the Belgrove Hotel. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Discussions between Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council remain ongoing as we consider that the well-being of the Belgrove's residents would be met best met through adopting a wider approach to address issues such as the provision of homelessness services for those with the most complex needs. Uh, the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group published its recommendations for ending rough sleeping earlier this month. Uh, they contain measures to support vulnerable homeless people with complex needs, which will include many of those who reside at the Belgrove. For example, proposals to move to a rapid rehousing model and a housing first approach for people experiencing homelessness, which seeks to support the person with needs such as mental health or addiction. Uh, we have accepted all of the recommendations in principle and will work closely with our partners to implement these. This includes continuing to work with Glasgow City Council to improve options and outcomes for those who are currently using the Belgrove Hotel. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer and I welcome uh, any progress to providing more support for what can be 140 vulnerable men uh, in that establishment. But I wonder if the Minister would agree that we also need a change in regulations and that either we need to tighten up on the HMO licences or the care inspectorate needs to be given more power to go into places like the Belgrove. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Belgrove Hotel is not typical of homelessness accommodation uh, and this case involves many complex issues as Mr Mason is well aware. Um, for that reason I think that legislative change in these areas is unlikely to achieve the desired result. It's the responsibility of local authorities to administer the licensing of HMOs and they have a duty to take into account the condition of the living accommodation as well as the safety and security of persons likely to occupy it. Glasgow City Council has previously taken action through HMO licensing, compelling the owners of the Belgrove Hotel to improve electrical safety and bathroom facilities. Uh, the Care Inspectorate, which Mr Mason also mentioned, uh, regulates the provision of care services as, as defined under Schedule 12 uh, of the Public Service Reform Act Scotland 2010. However, as Belgrove Hotel is privately owned and the owners do not provide any care to the residents, there is no requirement for regulation by the Care Inspectorate. Uh, and that is why both the Government and the Council uh, believe the solution has to be part of the wider delivery of homelessness services in the city. In this regard, the measures recommended by the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group will play a, a vital role in resolving the situation at the Belgrove. Thank you. And question two has not been lodged. Question number three, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action is taken to protect the rights of council tenants who are in a minority position regarding essential communal repairs. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, local authorities are required under the Housing Scotland Act 2001 uh, to keep houses they let wind and water tight and in all other respects reasonably fit for human habitation. Uh, they are also required under the Scottish Social Housing Charter to ensure that homes let by them in their capacity as a registered social landlord comply with the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. Uh, where local authorities are owners of some flats in a tenement, they should work with other owners to maintain any part of the building which provides support or shelter to any other part and have the same rights as other owners to enforce common works and to carry out emergency works. Local author authorities also have recourse to their general powers to require owners in tenements to carry out work to repair or maintain substandard, substandard housing by serving work notices and maintenance orders. Angus MacDonald. Thank the Minister for his reply. Um, the, the power to recover what's referred to as the missing shares, which was introduced in the 2014 Housing Act, is very welcome. However, if local authorities are not prepared to use that power, it leaves tenants living in what can often be unacceptable conditions for considerable periods of time. Responding to Ben McPherson's members' debate on the 9th of January, the Minister stated he intended to extend the missing shares powers later in the year. What progress has been made on that and what more can the Scottish Government do to ensure local authorities use the powers they already have been given to address the issue through the 2014 Housing Act? Minister. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Macdonald for his question. Uh, missing shares powers are only available if a majority of owners agree to carry out works. If housing is substandard, all local authorities have powers to require owners to carry out work to bring houses up to standard. If housing is below the tolerable standard, the local authority has a statutory duty to ensure that it is closed, demolished or brought up to standard within a reasonable period. Uh, regulations to extend missing share powers to permit registered social landlords to recover missing shares for common works are currently being drafted and will be laid in Parliament very shortly. It's for local authorities to determine how best to make use of their statutory powers to meet local conditions and priorities. However, uh, I commend the work that has been taken forward through Scotland's housing network to share best practice and encourage the effective use of these new powers. And I hope all local authorities will take account of what the Scottish Housing Network is doing in terms of that sharing of best practice. And Graham Simpson. Uh, thank you. Um, councils are largely not using the powers that they have. Um, and this is because they see, see it as a, a, a risk. Um, that aside, uh, the Minister will be aware that there's a cross-party working group being established, uh, convened by uh, Ben McPherson, uh, co-convened by myself, to look at the very complex issues around tenement repairs. So could I simply ask the Minister, will he uh, pledge to work closely with that group as we develop proposals to solve this issue? Minister. Um, in answer to the first part of uh, Mr uh, Simpson's question in terms of councils using these powers, uh, I'm pleased to say that some councils who previously uh, were not using mis missing share powers uh, now are, um, and I would encourage all local authorities uh, to use these powers uh, to help the citizens uh, in their area. Uh, in terms of working cooperatively and collaboratively uh, on this issue, uh, I am more than willing uh, to listen to the views of the um, group that has been established by Ben McPherson um, and I will uh, continue to, to work cooperatively and co collaboratively with everyone uh, on this particular issue. Uh, and I wish that group well in its deliberations and I look forward uh, to hearing what they're up to in the very near future, presiding officer. Thank you. Question four has not been lodged. Question five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what actions it is taking to ensure that, in instances of bullying, schools act to protect both parties and ensure that the school environment remains a safe place. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, bullying of any kind is entirely unacceptable and must be addressed swiftly and effectively whenever it arises in schools. The Government has fully funded Respect Me Scotland's anti-bullying service since its inception. And in 2018-19, we will provide over £298,000 to Respect Me. This provides direct support to all those working with children and young people to address all types of bullying effectively. To support schools and local authorities, in November 2017, the Government published Respect for All, the national approach to anti-bullying for Ch Scotland's children and young people. Respect for All provides an overarching framework and context for all anti-bullying work that is undertaken in Scotland. It reflects getting it right for every child and promotes an approach of working with children and young people to help change their behaviour. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And can I, I, I agree that, that the vast majority of schools act swiftly and appropriately to deal with instances of bullying? I am raising this specifically uh, a, for a constituent who has quite a disturbing case uh, of her, um, uh, where their daughter has been bullied for the last six years in and out of school. Um, and I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could let me know what recourse he thinks is available to parents where uh, the school hasn't perhaps acted the way that he wishes. Cabinet Secretary. The uh, approach that I've set out in, the, uh, in my original answer is designed to provide the reassurance that in all schools there is good practice to be making reference and taking account of the respect for all approach and the services that are avail available from respect me. Um, if Mr Whittle wishes to raise with me um, the specific circumstances, I will, um, in, uh, I will look into those and raise the necessary concerns with the local authority and the school concerned to make sure that this is properly addressed. Uh, just the other week there, the Respect Me organisation marked its 10th anniversary and there was a, an event in Parliament uh, that I attended 
And there was a presentation that evening from Holy Cross High School in Hamilton of the approaches, new approaches the school is taking towards bullying, uh, tackling bullying. It is, in my estimation, one of the finest examples of a cohesive strategy to tackle bullying and to make sure that schools are the safe places that all of us want our schools to be. So there is excellent practice out there within Scottish schools, uh, as with all of these challenges within education, uh, the challenge is to make sure that is systemic so that all young people in all circumstances have access to high quality support in resolving these issues. <laughs> Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what measures are in place in schools to educate pupils to the damage caused by insidious online bullying, which of course follows you from school to your bedroom? Right, Secretary. Christine Graham raises a, a, a very significant development in all of this area where young people may have felt that uh, they would have some protection at home from some of the experiences of bullying that they may fear uh, outside uh, uh, in the community or at school but um, as Christine Graham correctly points out digital connectivity and social media has now established that further connection I can assure Christine Graham that in respect for all uh, further steps have been taken to ensure that the behavior that she quite rightly highlights in Parliament today is fully incorporated into that thinking and in the example that I cited to Mr Whittle of the experience in Holy Cross High School in Hamilton is a very good example of how the digital dimension has been fully incorporated into the approaches and the support that's envisaged within the anti-bullying policies that are pioneered in our schools. Thank you very much. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to review the requirement for corroboration in relation to prosecuting reported sexual crimes. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. We proposed abolishing the requirement for corroboration in all criminal cases during the passage of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016. At that time, however, there was no legal or parliamentary consensus for the abolition. We therefore asked Lord Bonamy to review what say additional safeguards may be required if the corroboration rule was removed. The review recommended a wide range of substantive and constructive criminal justice reforms. One of the key recommendations of Lord Bonamy's group was that research into jury reasoning and decision making should be undertaken so that any changes to our jury system is informed by evidence that could point to safeguards if the rule is abolished. We took forward this recommendation and this research is now well underway. It is due to be completed in autumn 2019. Any future consideration of corroboration reforms need to await the findings of this important research and be considered in the wider context of that and other recommendations of the Lord Bonamy report. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Emma Bryson is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and she recently bravely told her story to the Scotsman. Emma's case could not be prosecuted due to the requirement for corroboration. Rape Crisis Scotland say that this is the most common reason given to rape survivors for not prosecuting. And as the Cabinet Secretary is aware, in 2016-17, only 13% of reported and attempted rapes were prosecuted. It's been three years since the Scottish Government made the, the commitment to review corroboration that the Cabinet Secretary had referred to, and I welcome the update today. But survivors of rape want justice now, Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what steps, what decisive steps the Government will take to improve the prosecution rates for these abhorrent crimes? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, uh, I accept that the conviction rate for um, rape continues to be low in comparison to other offences. And uh, this reflects in part the challenging evidential requirements uh, of uh, proving uh, rape. Uh, and that includes the requirement for corroboration. Uh, the member will be aware that when we brought forward this proposal to Parliament, her own party opposed the abolition of corroboration at that time and did so in a very vigorous fashion. However, we have taken practical measures in order to address some of the issues around improving convictions around rape cases. For example, we strengthened the law around sexual crime with the Sexual Offences Act 2009, which for the first time introduced a statutory definition of consent uh, in rape cases. We also introduced just last year 
the new requirement for statutory jury direction to be provided by judges in rape trials. It is worth pointing out, Signing Officer, overall, although cases uh, that are uh, convicted remain too low, they are twice the level that they were 10 years ago and nearly triple the level that we've seen since 2010-11. A key part of the work in order to help to address this issue is to make sure that we have sufficient advocacy workers uh, working with women who may report rape. And that's why we've continued to provide funding to Rape Crisis Scotland to provide these advocacy workers. And I do hope from the tone of the question asked by the member here today that there appears to be a change of heart in the Labour Party's position now on the issue of corroboration and will support any proposals to abolish it in the future if the government brings those forward. Bruno Mackay. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what action the Scottish Government is taking to reduce the levels of domestic and sexual crime and what support is given to the victims of those crimes? Cabinet Secretary. So, so we work with a range of stakeholders on uh, matters relating to domestic abuse and also sexual offences. As I mentioned, we've also already strengthened legislation around the uh, definition of uh, rape cases uh, and we've also taken forward action just in the last few months by the passage of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018, which will provide an extended uh, definition of domestic abuse, which will include psychological, coercive and controlling behaviour. Police Scotland have the Domestic Abuse uh, Task Force, which targets those who are prolific offenders of domestic abuse and have also introduced the Domestic Abuse Disclosure Scheme, which has now been operating since October 2015, with some 900 people being told that their partner has a history of abusive behaviour. As I also mentioned, advocacy workers have an important part to play in working with individuals who have experienced sexual crime. That's why we provided £1.85 million to Rape Crisis Scotland to allow them to take forward an advocacy project to provide advocacy workers right across Scotland, including into our island communities of Shetland and Orkney, for the first time. I announced uh, just last month an extension of that funding in order to not only continue with the existing advocacy project, but also to increase uh, the level of support in those areas where there is greatest demand. And we'll continue to work with a range of organisations to ensure we're doing everything possible to tackle domestic abuse and sexual crime. Question seven has not been lodged. Question eight, Alex Crowell Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the prescription of cannabis derived therapies on the NHS. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Regulation for the licensing, safety, and efficacy of medicines is currently reserved to the UK Government and is the responsibility of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency who operate on a UK-wide basis. All med medicinal products must be fully tested and researched before they can be licensed by either the MHRA or the European Medicines Agency. If a pharmaceutical company obtains such a license, then it would be for them to make a submission to the Scottish Medicines Consortium requesting that the medicine be considered for routine or restricted use in NHS Scotland. Alice Crow Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My constituent, Murray Gray, suffers many violent seizures every single day due to a rare form of epilepsy. He is just five years old. The only relief that could be afforded to Murray is in the properties of the cannabis derivative cannabidiol, also known as CBD. It is legal, but not currently available on the NHS for the reasons outlined by the Cabinet Secretary. His mother, Karen, is willing to procure and administer it herself, but wants medical support and advice to do this safely. Will the Cabinet Secretary work with NHS Scotland to permit the family's neurologist to support the family in the safe use of this therapy? And which, will she agree to meet with Karen and myself to discuss the wider issues around Murray's situation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have every sympathy for Murray Gray and his family, and of course I would be happy uh, to meet with him. But I, I see in an article that the member uh, uh, gave to the Scotsman on the 22nd of March that he says the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland won't approve a licence for its use. Now, I hope in my first answer I've made it clear to Alex Cole Hamilton that it's not the Scottish Government or the NHS that approves licences for use of such products. He's simply wrong in that. Under the terms of the current UK-wide regulations, manufacturers of medicinal products must have a licence for their medicine
system before it can be placed on the market in the UK for good safety reasons. Currently, there are no cannabidiol products which have obtained a licence. At this moment, Sativex is the only medicine containing cannabis extracts which has been granted a licence for use in the UK. Um, in order for it to be made available on the NHS in Scotland, a submission has to be made to the SMC, as I said, said in my first answer. A decision on whether to make a submission is entirely one for the company, and they have so far chosen not to do so. Very happy to uh, continue a dialogue with the member, but it's important that we get the facts straight about where licences are issued from, and it's not from the Scottish Government, and it's not from the NHS in Scotland. Happy to meet, and happy to meet the family to discuss it further. Thank you very much.